Hi, everybody. Thank you for attending our event tonight. Um, this is a second event with the College Library, the Department of History, and our collaborative partner, the Los Angeles Regional Reentry Partnership for a Dialogue with Women in Carceral Space. So tonight's event, we're so grateful that um, you are here to share space with us. Let me go ahead and put into chat our itinerary for this evening. Um, at the end of the event tonight, uh, we might have a little you know, space for um, questions if you would like to put them in chat. We're gonna be monitoring, monitoring that, excuse me. But again, um, welcome to our collaborative event, Retelling Her Story, Empowerment and Healing with Formerly Incarcerated Women. My name is Dr. Dennis. I am from the Department of History at Cal State LA, and I am co-hosting this event with Azalea Camacho the college, the archivist for special collections at the Cal State LA Library. Azalea, did you want to say hi before we move in? Sure, I just want to say hi to everyone. Again, I'm Azalea Camacho. I'm the archivist and special collections librarian um, at Cal State LA, and I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Um, this is um, year two of our program, and I just wanted to give you guys a little historical context to how we all started collaborating together. Um, the work that you are seeing tonight was born out of an exhibit that focused on the work of Mervyn Dimely, who was a California state senator. He was a lieutenant governor uh, from Trinidad, and he visited every prison in the state of California. LARP became an early collaborative partner on our Cal Humanities grant and really gave us expert um, you know, testimony and narrative and powerful stories um, to build this exhibit out. And so in our second year of this you know, event, we wanted to really focus on women again. Um, one of the things that Azalea and I and our students saw with these letters was that there was no letters written to Mervyn Dimely um, from women. And if we're talking about a carceral space in history, we need to include the women's experience. And so, you know, from the Mervyn Dimely exhibit, we started collaborating with LARP, we started collaborating with students again um, to really build this event out, to really reach um, an audience, to share the narratives of women that are behind bars and to hear um, how their lived experiences are going to shape public policy uh, in today's landscape. Um, so I would like to turn it over to our guest speakers. Um, we have two tonight. The first one is Pastor Troy Vaughn, who is the Executive Director of the Los Angeles Regional Reentry Partnership. And our second guest speaker is Laura Hernandez, who was a, um, on, you know, one of the inaugural cohorts of the Leaders Program at LARP, and she participated last year. So she's going to share updates with us. And, and, and talk to the audience about really um, her, her experiences in a carceral system. Um, I'd like to hand this over now to Pastor Troy, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's such a, it's such a blessing to be here and the energy and the spaces is wonderful. And always we're just so grateful to be in partnership with you guys because um, it's nothing like um, empowering women to um, go forth with their, their full selves, right? Too many times, especially in the carceral system, when women have been shut down and um, not allowed to um, use their full power um, to bring about the change. And we can't change anything without women. I, I know that as a married man, I need my wife to give birth to the vision that I have. Without her, there would be no um, Troy really exploring his full self. And so there's a reason why I believe that the Lord chose women to bring forth life. You guys nurture and bring life and create life and everything that you say and do. So I want to speak empowerment to our women today. On this call tonight, you guys are the vessels that are honored above all things. And here at LARP, we try to empower our women to be in leadership positions, um, to give voice and passion to the work that they do, to speak into their creativity, um, to find their true selves, to be all that they can be. Um, and I want you to feel that energy today. I want you to know that um, through this process, as you get ready to return home or if you're in school or whatever you're doing, trying to get your family back, find yourself, be a full-time mother, um, be a full-time student at the same time, be a community leader at the same time. I'm here to tell you that you can do all things, that you can achieve anything that you would like to do. Um, and so I want to empower you. I want to encourage you, lift you up. Um, I don't care who try to be downtrodden on you and try to step on you. I'm here to speak life to you, to tell you that 
that you can do all things and that um, that you are the vessel that gives life to everything that you touch. And so remember that, um, that you have the creative energy. And so go forth, be a collaborator, be a collaborator with your co-women, be a collaborator with the men in your life, be a collaborator with people that you're in business with, that you're studying with, be a collaborator and allow your, your gifting to make room for you. Um, we try to do that. Um, we're so proud of the, the women that are part of our, our Leaders um, Academy. I'm so proud to see Laura on this call tonight um, to give her full testimony and all the things that she's overcome and um, being a part of our inaugural cohort. And now the women, all the women that are attending our, our current cohort and that and the cohorts that are going to come subsequent from these two that have been birthed. Um, it's really about this level of partnership when we come forth. We can't do it without each other, you guys. We need each other um, to do this. And so I'm encouraged on tonight by how where this partnership is, but I'm more encouraged about the partnership I see five years from now on um, what we're going to become. Um, it's great to be in this space, but what can we do if we stick together and continue to form new relationship and look for new funding opportunities and new opportunities of employment and empowerment together? And so um, I thank you for allowing me to speak and um, to speak into your lives. Thank you for allowing me to be here. Um, there's a lot of things going on in the world. And Sometimes we need to just stop, pause, breathe for a minute, catch a breath, exhale, get our grounding, know who we are, be rooted in this present moment. Um, and when we can do that together and, and, and encourage and lift each other up, that's when we achieve true empowerment. So thank you for allowing me to be here. Thank you for allowing me to speak into this space. I want to give a shout out to members on my team, Anthony and Juliana and all of those others that are there, Caitlin and Evelyn and all of them that keep lifting us up. My brother Charles, who handles our policy stuff, my brother Joe Paul, Eve and Lynn and all of the, um, the women and the men that support one another. And we're a family here at LARP. And, and so it's my honor to be here um, on tonight um, to speak at this beginning of this session with you guys. And so um, God bless all of you guys and um, let's have a good, um, good, good evening together. Thank you so much, Pastor Troy. I so appreciate energy here. Um, I did want to shout out Anthony Garcia. Anthony Garcia and I worked with Azalea on this project, this Dimely exhibit. So I think it's just great that Anthony and I and Azalea and everybody else can come together and really, um, you know, provide a space um, for the most important aspect of this evening, which is women, um, which is women from the Leaders Program. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker for tonight. Her name is Laura Hernandez, and she is here to share testimony, her narrative, her story, which is unfinished. And so, Laura, I turn the Zoom room over to you, please. Thank you so much. Um, I am so grateful to be here. Thank you all for inviting me and um, to the women in the room that are going through the cohort. You know, um, I just want to share that when I went through the cohort last year, it was at the perfect time, right? And um, I learned a lot as um, somebody that has formerly incarcerated and coming out to the world and trying to navigate um, a new world with new rules because it was pandemic, right? It was kind of difficult. I had been gone for 15 years. So it was um, a really big challenge for me. I didn't even know what ATMs looked like anymore. So it was a challenge. And coming to LARP was an opportunity that I was given. And, you know, I felt like it was right what I needed at that time. And I learned a lot with LARP. You know, um, I, I learned about, you know, we, we, entered a bunch of different spaces and we were sitting at tables that I never thought I'd be seated at. And we learned about legislature. And I mean, I learned the process of a bill, which I never knew before. Um, I learned a lot of leadership development skills, you know, and like just how to tell your story in a way that really um, captures the message that you're trying to get across to folks, right? So I just want to encourage y'all to just continue to open yourselves up to the um, skills that you'll learn at LARP. And um, they're not all like the type of skill that, you know, is on like um, a roadmap or anything. A lot of the things I learned too um, came through just simple, like interpreting the moment, interpreting the temperature of the room and just understanding the things that were not being said. That was super important as well. Um, after I graduated from Larchwood, which was a huge accomplishment for me, um, graduation was awesome. It was virtual, but it was awesome. And um, afterwards, 
Um, my life kind of took a little bit of a hard turn. Um, my dad got sick and there was a lot going on in my life. And I had a job opportunity that I was not able to take that I thought was, you know, uh, what God had for me at that moment. But um, I, I was unable to take it because um, my life had just turned, you know, life happens, right? As we all know, life happens and there's nothing you can do to stop it. And I'm telling you, um, when Pastor Troy was just talking right now and he was sharing, like, not to allow anything to stand in your way, I just want to um, lift that up again, right? We can't let things get in our way because I was really close to, I mean, I had thoughts of like, what was this all for? You know, look at where, how hard I've worked. And I mean, I was working three jobs, y'all. I had a car and a place to stay 30 days out the gate. I'm what they call a go-getter. I don't let things get in my way, but when your family starts getting involved and, and things start happening to your loved ones, it can get really, really difficult, right? And I had moments of despair, moments of, of, of not understanding what was going to happen. Um, just a lot of stuff was going, but you know what? I didn't give up. I didn't give up and I just kept pushing along and pushing along and trusting the process, trusting my skill set, trusting um, God, right, to make sure that I was going to reach all the goals that I wanted to reach. So approximately uh, a month and a half ago, um, I got a job um, that I'm really grateful to have. I'm now the program coordinator for the Orange County Rapid Response Network. And I love what I do. You know, it's a program that focuses on um, removal defense. Folks that are caught between the immigration and criminal justice system come into our space to support their family members who are either detained or on ankle monitors. And we're fighting really hard, you know, to, to get these folks free, right? And um, there's a lot that goes with that, right? A lot of um, emotional time as a physical time that goes into this kind of work. But as a community advocate and organizer, I can tell you that I really believe that, you know, LARP helped me understand, or at least cemented, right, the knowledge of what it was that I wanted to do with my life. Did I want to be in a corporate job? Or did I really want to follow my passions, right? And when you come home from doing so much time, you know, you feel so behind, right? Other women my age have homes, have, you know, um, marriages, have um, businesses, have all this. So there's like this urgency to hurry up and catch up, right? And the only way to catch up, we think, is just like with money. And yeah, man, money is so important because you can't really get anything done if you don't have it. But at the end of the day, I think beyond money is determination and your drive, your ambition to just keep going. Because let me tell you, um, last year, I didn't have a lot of money, but I kept plugging away. I kept plugging away. And now I have a great job. I work from home. I don't have to pay for gas. Um, I, I, I can, you know, navigate my, my personal life. And um, I'm also happy to, to um, share that three days ago, I became a homeowner. Um, so, and I have not even celebrated my two year anniversary home from a 50, uh, 27 to life sentence. So I'm hoping that my story will add fuel to your fire. If I can do it, y'all can do it. If, if LARP is there for to help you, to assist you. I mean, Anthony was super supportive and super helpful throughout my journey. Pastor Troy Vaughn, I can't, I'm, I don't even need to say, right? Um, Y'all know when he speaks, it just moves you to the core. It, his words are felt, right? And um, Juliana was always super supportive of me as well. And um, Joe Paul was super supportive. Like, this is a group of people that I feel is um, a, a network that's literally like a net right they're there if you fall they're gonna it, they're gonna be there they're not gonna let you go and I know over the course of the last year um they've reached out to me from time to time just to check in say hey how are you doing hope everything's good you know they didn't just let me go and forget and and buy right and then this invitation showed up in my inbox and I was super excited because I know um, the power that women hold, just like uh, Pastor Troy Vaughn was sharing, I know it because I felt it, I've experienced it, and I've dished it out. Sometimes people walk across my path and they don't know what's coming. 
you know, and I can really share that, you know, I got a lot of confidence through LARP as well, you know, confidence to speak up at these tables, because now, you know, it, with the job that I do now, you know, I have to talk to senators and Congress people and other community activists and other organizations, and I feel confident in my, in my space, I feel confident. And one thing I would like to share with y'all is, if you are ever in a space and that nagging, creepy little thought comes across your mind that says you don't belong there or you don't fit in or what are you doing? Just remember that you absolutely do belong because the work that we're out here doing, they can't do it without us. It's just not going to get done. They've tried for so many years and, you know, our advancement has been so little, but now with um, organizations empowering directly impacted folks, now I believe we're going to move the needle. So just remember that you do belong at that table. Absolutely. Your power is strong. Thank you. Laura, thank you so much for that narrative. I'm so proud of you and you're a homeowner. I love that. I think this is fabulous. I'm so glad that I met you last year. You talked a little bit about community and I wanted to add that this event is also um, co-sponsored by the American Community Programs at Cal State LA. And when we talk about community, you know, one of the things that Azalea has stressed in her own work and my, my work as a public historian is that, you know, are we inclusive of the community, all communities? And if we argue that we are, you know, inclusive of everybody, then the American Communities Program is inclusive of formerly incarcerated and incarcerated women. And I just wanted to add that, that I think LARP is just a fine example of what community is. And I'm so appreciative, um, Laura, of hearing your, your testimony tonight. Um, as we move on in our program, I wanna to introduce to you Anthony Garcia, who is the project coordinator for the leadership program of which Laura is an alumni. And so I would like to introduce Anthony, my collaborative partner, my co-conspirator in a lot of these events, um, for him to really just talk a little bit about the leaders program before we move into the main event, which is of course our women and re-entry. So Anthony, I turn over the Zoom room to you, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Dennis. And before I get onto what the Leadership Training Academy is, I just like to say how proud I am of you, Laura, and all your accomplishments. I am super impressed with you know, the advancements you've made despite your challenges that you have in front of you. And uh, you are a perfect example of no matter what you're going through in life, um, you still can get over whatever you know, it's put in front of you, you can overcome it and just keep pushing until you get what you what you need and what you want in life. Um, but yeah, it's just, I'm, I'm so, so proud to hear everything that Laura's doing. Um, but yeah, with, with that being said, um, the Leadership Training Academy. So the, the Leadership Training Academy is uh, a, pro, a program where we onboard and we recruit, we uh, collaborate, um, we, bring on, we bring on board, a diverse group of 12 individuals who are all either recently incarcerated, formerly incarcerated in some capacity, but that have been um, impacted by the system and um, you know have stepped the foot inside of, of an incarceral system. So the idea is to help these individuals and give them the tools and the capacity to uh, become effective leaders in our community, elevate their skills, elevate their, their um, presentation skills, um, to elevate and help them become better leaders by knowing where, what our resources are available, what challenges and barriers are in place to help and eliminate them, but also know how to advocate for yourself and for others. So the, the goal of this Leadership Training Academy um, you know, was spurred by the idea of wanting to help lived experience people get a seat at the table to also not, also, not only lead by example, but also make the change that's needed in our community and in the system as a whole. And by doing so, we will then, um, like Laura explained, we will then make an actual lasting impact, not from people that are looking, looking outside, looking in into the system and to the communities we come from, but from the inside out, from the people who are actually directly impacted from this incarceral system. And, you know, it starts with, you know, coming together as a community like we do here, and then also speaking up for ourselves, right? Speaking up for those that don't have a voice so that way we can make those impacts and those changes on the legislative level and institutional level. So that's ultimately what the Leadership Training Academy is. That's a quick summary of what it is. And uh, we intend to make 
lasting changes in our communities to develop healthy communities and to develop healthier systems that are in place. Um, if we're going to be living in these systems, we want to make sure that they're equitable and they, uh, they provide opportunity to everybody across the board, not just, uh, not just hold the status quo that exists and leave the people that are in power in those positions because it has not worked to this day. So that's ultimately what the Leadership Training Academy is about. And I'm very, very proud and honored to have been a part of this experience. And I will continue to give it my best and continue to advocate for those that, um, that, that can't speak, that don't have, feel like they don't have a voice, uh, but also uplift those that do have a voice and show support, right? I, I wanna make sure that it's reassured that everybody who needs support in any way, um, they can depend on me um, in the capacity that I could do it. So that's uh, more or less of who I am um, and what the Leadership Training Academy is about. Thank you, Anthony, so much for that. Um, before we introduce our panelists and everything and start the dialogue, I wanted to remind everybody that Mervyn Dimely in the 1970s was one of the first politicians to go into our prisons and to actually work at a level to bring about reform and change. His daughter, Lynn Dimely, and I bring her up because she is influential in his work, went, you know, went to every prison that she could with her daddy. And although she can't be here tonight, Lynn was really an advocate for women. And she would be so proud of what we see here tonight with LARP and Laura um, and the other panelists as well. And so this video will be sent to Lynn as we continue to work with Dimely's daughter on important matters. But like um, Anthony said, it's time to bring the ladies to the table and really get into some dialogue about these unfinished narratives, okay? So um, I would like to introduce our panelists this evening, Betty Mills, Laura Hernandez. We also have Rabia Kutab, if I got it right, I'm hoping I did. Um, Jane Bond is here um, and that's it. So ladies, let's just you know get right into a a impactful dialogue. I want to hear about your unfinished narrative, about who you are. You know, like Laura said, what makes you grind? What's your energy like? And so one of the first questions that I want to ask to everybody, um, and, and we can just, you know, everybody just talks. I, I, we're not going to go in order. I don't want to have just one person speaking. I want us all to just share space. Um, the first question that I wanted to ask you is, how has the transition been for you coming home? Um, I, we know it's difficult. We know that you're coming into an environment that has changed dramatically since the pandemic. Um, but how has this transition been uh, for you ladies? I guess I'll start. My name is Betty. <laughs> and um, I've been home almost eight years now after serving an 18 and a half year sentence. And wow, uh, when I first got out, everything was so brand new. Um, um, there was really no cell phones per se. Um, so um, all of that was new. Um, the laptops, all this different technology was very different. Um, you know, transitioning from having, being told where to go, where to stand, when to eat, when to get up, um, all those things coming home to, um, you know, now being attempting to be self-sufficient was difficult. Um, getting your ID, um, getting your, you know, social security, which is something that isn't um, available to you prior to getting out, which is a difficult thing because you, you need your birth certificate, you need your driver's license, you need your social security card, and you need all of those things to get just one thing. So it's kind of crazy, <laughs> you know? and um, you know, that was a little difficult. Um, I fared better than most because um, I have a strong family support and my family had most of my things. There are a lot of women that um, were in the transition program with me that um, had lost contact with their family or didn't have family that actually kept um, old documents or documents and stuff like that. So um, I was, it was a little bit less difficult for me because, you know, my parent, my father still had a lot of my stuff. Um, but getting those things um, was difficult. Also, during my transition, they had just started, which was great and wonderful, um, setting you up with 
um, with your Medi-Cal prior to leaving the prison, which is something that they hadn't done in the past. So I was just like on the cusp of them starting that. So um, that kind of helped my transition. Um, and a lot of people didn't like the fact that because I was serving a life sentence, um, a lot of women didn't like that when you got out, the board actually uh, mandated that um, you go to a transition program for at least six months. That actually was a saving grace for me because that transition program allowed me to focus on getting particular things. And it was a good transition program because it was Crossroads Inc. in Claremont. And they really focus on making sure that you get your driver's license, your birth certificate, um, you, you know, your first job, um, you get acclimated into a community. And I don't know if anyone's familiar with Claremont, but Claremont's a pretty nice community to get acclimated to your first time out. Um, so, and then um, I had parole agents that I don't know if um, it was the sign of the times of, of change or whatever, but we had parole agents that actually worked with lifers. Um, and we had a lifers group that was called, uh, it was uh, um, the PRNN group and they call it PERN. And um, we actually had meetings once a month where we communicated, but it was difficult. It was difficult um, acclimating, getting out, getting all those things done, um, you know, finding myself um, after that long period of time, it was exhilarating too, you know, um, but not having a voice for so long and then having people ask you, well, what do you want to do? How do you want to do it? Um, it was frightening for me. Um, but there were also um, people like uh, Professor Reese at Cal Poly Pomona that had the reintegration program. And um, right away I started uh, talking with him and started, I started with the Reintegration Academy. So I was able to um, um, start with Mount SAC almost immediately after um, my first six months out. And um, that helped um, me kind of transition and um, get to know what I wanted to do, talking with him, talking with other people. Um, I had lost my voice for so long that I was afraid to tell people what I wanted. And um, you know, having young students, young people uh, open up to me and 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 see that they knew what they wanted, and here I was, you know, like twice their age. I'm not giving my age away, but <laughs> I was like more than twice their age, and um, they knew what they wanted, um, so it helped me. But yeah, it was a difficult road, but um, having just a few things in place. Um, it made a huge difference. So I know that if we can move forward with um, making sure that women start, before they even leave the prison, they, they have their IDs, they have their social security card, they have money saved, they, they're, they're, they get an education, um, they quite possibly a higher education, um, a BA or, or um, you know, maybe even a PhD and, and um, they have things set in place for them. It, it makes a world difference, so. Thank you, Betty, for starting that out. And we're gonna come revisit some of the things that she said. I wanted to open up the floor to Jane Bond and okay. as well. So Jane, please. Well, you know, when I first um, welcome everybody to my space, um, appreciate you here um, with me. Uh, when I got out, it was a while back, but I know I was happy to get out, <laughs> but I, I wasn't too sure about how the, my family or my friends were going to receive me because before I went to prison, I was, you know, ripping and roaring on Skid Row. You know, that's what I, I, that was my preferred place to be. And so when I went to prison, my mom kind of like knew where I was and I was safe relatively safe you know and 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 when I got out of when I was ready to transition you know um they had lost my file so it was like I didn't even know where I was going to go and and um there was a they said I was going to go to San Pedro I thought I was that was San Pedro street and Skid Road I'm like no I can't go there you know and and I knew that um I was ready I was tired of 
of the lifestyle I was leading. You know, I had been arrested to that point. I had 47 misdemeanors. And so, you know, that was my, I had caught five felonies on the same case when I was in the high speed chase. And, you know, even though my mom seen me on, 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 on TV, um, it's funny is that my brothers are, they're, they're, they're um, doing life and they called my mom to tell her that I was on the news. And then she's, they're like, what? And, 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 you know, when I got out or when I talked to her after when I, when I was able to talk to her it was a while out, um, she said, you know, I, I hate to say this, Miha, but I was happy to see you were alive, you know, and you know, she was, she wanted me to be safe and she didn't know how me coming out was going to affect that. You know, was I going to go right back to where I was going before, what I was doing before. And um, I have to agree with uh, Betty when she says that, you know, me going to the, um, so I was part of the program called 1453, Senate Bill 1453, which allowed you to get off parole in five months if you completed a residential treatment program. Where is that program? I don't know. But um, it was very successful for me because I went to the program, um, uh, Fred Brown Recovery Services in San Pedro. And from there, I was able to excel, um, got off parole and I, and I uh, became the operations coordinator and then a case manager. So um, for, for women coming out of prison. So that was like, uh, you know, which is one of the questions you'll ask later. So, you know, I was in fear. I, I have to say that coming out with, to, you know, not knowing, because you, you, you could feel like, I, I'm tired of being tired. I don't want to live that life anymore. I'm tired of smoking crack because I was smoking crack on Skid Row. I'm tired of drinking. But when you have the same people, you're going to the same environment that you left. And it's kind of like, here I am. You know, it's kind of like, you know, in the, in the program, they tell you not to go around in the 12-step program. Um, they tell you not to go around your, if you, if you hang out in a barbershop, you're going to get your haircut eventually and um and I, I i look for me like i said i'll, I'll piggyback off base it was important that i stay away from my neighborhood and, and i ended up in san pedro i didn't even when they told me i was going to uh uh san pedro and Fred, i was like that sounds like somebody smoking crack you know that's where i gotta be but you know um it wasn't like that for me it, it kind of helped it, it broke me from uh going back to my neighborhood and i think that was going to and I think that's important is knowing where you're going to go when you get out. Like, what are your plans? Those are, that's important because either you're going to face everything and recover your life, or you're going to F everything and run. And you're going to go right back to ripping and running with the same crowd that you do. That was just for me. I'm going to keep that in the eye. So that was important for me. So. Thank you, Jane. I appreciate that. Um, and we'll continue talking about that in a couple of seconds. I wanted to open up the floor to um, Rabia. If that's Rabia, is that how you pronounce your name? I apologize. It's fine. Nobody gets it the first time. It's Rabia Kutab. <laughs> so, <laughs> good job here, but I apologize for butchering that. But please share um, a little bit of your narrative, you know, since you've transitioned back home. And I, I kind of wanted to give Betty a shout out. Um, I didn't even realize she went to Mount Sac because we run a program there uh, for formerly incarcerated scholars. Uh, it's called Rising Scholars, and I've been working with them ever since the program started, um, and we've grown a lot. So, hey, go Mountie. <laughs> but um, good evening, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure always, always to be in spaces um, where voices of formerly incarcerated women are being uplifted, empowered. Um, my name is Rabia Kutab, and I'm a formerly incarcerated Pakistani woman. Um, and I truly believe that my reentry journey was a second chance to my life. Um, I was a little bit of, a little bit about me uh, prior to incarceration. Um, I was a pre-medical student. You know, I went to University of North Texas, um, graduated with honors, um, and I was on a pathway towards um, entering medical school. But things had happened to me after college that got me involved into organized crime. I don't know if it was my degree or I was way over my head. You know, I was in my early 20s, really young, um, but very risky, right? Um, and I always wanted to do things out of context. I, I never thought about what ultimating, uh, what actions cause, you know, to reactions and everything. And so I went into 
years of criminality and uh, ultimately led me into a downward spiral into addiction. Um, and I was convicted on my first crime. Um, I was looking at a 20 year sentence and at that point was that that was that was a game changer for me. Um, at that point, I was um, standing in front of a judge, um, you know, facing a, a sentence term that I thought was um, ridiculous to give into a, a person who clearly needed rehabilitation, right, and not punishment. And so um, went inside the carceral facility um, during a lot of my months and years into the into the incarceration. I decided to advocate for myself. And uh, through a process of appeals, I was able to get granted uh, freedom in 2020. Um, and this is happening in state of Texas. So all my incarceration was in um, state of Texas. However, my reentry journey is in Los Angeles. I deliberately left state of Texas knowing that the laws there, um, the policies there for formerly incarcerated people um, is not at all uh, progressing. Um, you know, it's a Republican state. I already know what barriers and obstacles I was going to face. Um, and my, past, my, my whole goal was to get out and uh, get into advocacy world, which I started while I was incarcerated for even women incarcerated with me, um, and get back into academia. And so my reentry journey started in LA, and I specifically chose to come to LA because I had done my research, and there was a lot of progress and liberal work being done towards uh, policy reformation for formerly incarcerated folks. There's a lot of funding being developed. There's a lot of programs um, being developed, and so I. It's been. It's. I mean, my transitional journey is. is it's, it's a roller coaster ride, right? So coming to LA, I had um, issues from not getting my identification in California to find finding housing. So we go loop around to back to obstacles and being a woman of color, it's like 10 times enhanced, right? Um, but however, I do believe that if you have it in you to change and use your second chance to become a good, to become a better version of yourself, it'll happen. And so I will say my transitional journey is still happening. Um, it's um, brought me a lot of blessings because I have able to kind of create a network here in LA that caters to women of formerly incarcerated scholars and leaders and advocates. Um, and so I think one of the things, most important things I wanna highlight is how important professional development is when it comes to somebody being away for so long, right? And then you come out to this world and you got new phones, you got MacBook Pros, like 14 inch, 13 inch, and you're like, what is going on? So one thing I tapped into, back into my education, back into academia, back into being an advocate um, and became part of spaces uh, where I was allowed to voice my um, opinions where I was allowed to help policymakers, um, you know, change laws uh, such as ban the box, uh, Pell Grant restoration. I did a lot of work with education trust in the sense, and so I learned how it is important for community to put our voices in the front line because we come not only from our lived experience, but we are smart as people, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and just and 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 one and and past mistakes and we're humans, right? So past mistakes, past errors um, can always be uh, redemptive. So it's a form of redemption for me. It's a form of, uh, form of discovering myself again. Um, and yeah, and so I work in a lot of spaces in higher education because I do believe that uh, education is the form of rehabilitation. Um, and I push forth that agenda, uh, especially for um, being a woman of color. I think um, the whole idea of Pell Grant restoration is important because it, it allows access to um, funding being trickled down into um, education programming for people who are incarcerated and also ultimately affecting, impacting the community of formerly incarcerated. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I'm so excited you're here. It's so good to meet you. Let me make sure we check on chat. Yes, Derek, it's a very powerful. Laura, did you want to add anything before we move on to our next questions about the transition? I know you spoke as a guest speaker, but would you like to add anything at this time? Um, I can just add, you know, that my transition home was uh, pretty, pretty difficult. But um, again, I kind of believe that um, you know, the systems that we have in place are um, not, well, maybe they are working. They're, they're working to what 
other folks think it should be working, but not the people that are directly impacted, right? But I just feel like that's why we have to um, continue in the efforts and the work that we're doing, uh, because we need to kind of be the voices that need to be heard, because um, half of these people don't really know what it's like to go out there. And I just sat in on a meeting the other day, and um, it was this elected official and talking about all the things they did with the ARPA funds that were given to Orange County. And um, he was talking about all these reentry homes and different things that he did. And I'm like, that's funny because I knew nothing about any of those and there was no knowledge. So it's like you build a sanctuary city, right? But if nobody knows where the city is, what good is it? So um, it's super important, I think, to continue to be in these conversations and to continue to inspire each other to continue down these paths because um, if not us, who, right? So yeah, and, and beautiful stories. Thank you all for sharing. Thank you, Laura, for that. Um, one of the themes that I picked up on every one of your narratives is the idea of to be inspired and to make space somewhere else. And I, I was reminded of what Nipsey Hussle had said um, when, and I quote, if you look at the people in your circle and you don't get inspired, you don't have a circle, you have a cage. And every one of you so far has talked about leaving an environment um, that contributes to your downfall and recognizing that, Jane, I think your narrative was so powerful um, when you talked about San Pedro. One of the next questions that I wanted to ask just the, uh, the panelists in general is how has the opportunities that you have been given um, and, and have earned and have fought for and everything help shape what you do going forward at this point? Um, so where you're at right now in the leadership program in LARP, how are these opportunities creating other opportunities for you, um, you know, to again establish what we would like is, is just full freedom as women and everything. So what are some of these opportunities that you have taken a chance on or participated in, um, even if it's through LARP? Let's talk about that for a minute. Um, I'll, I'll start. Um... So when I did get, get out of uh, prison, I went to the program in San Pedro and became the operations coordinator. From there, um, you know, I, I didn't really understand what, it, so I know what it is to be like, hey, so there's this party going on. So why don't you get some of your girls and we'll work that party. Um, so what I did for myself, well, how I, how I approached it is I just flipped it. Right. So it's always been about the hustle, but it's about what you're trying to hustle for. So are you trying to hustle for the for, you know, the, the I'll just say the negative, which is like, you know, just like this. Let's get some more uh, um, alcohol. Let's go fuel some more drugs. Or are you trying to hustle for what's good? What, what can empower people? Because, you know, at the end of the day, if we're not if if we're not giving a hand, if we're not trying to help, then are we help? If we're not trying to help another, like raise them to another uh to be on themselves, you know, to inspire somebody to do something better than what are, what are we doing here, you know. Um, so I was lucky I was able to be the operations coordinator and then I was able to, I was able to, I was able to, uh, to, tell, to tell my group, like my, my employer, my group, that, like my um, employer, getting feedback right here, um, that like we need a reentry and employment um, program. That and like, they said, sure, you, want, you want a reentry program, and let's go ahead and do it. And I'm like, okay, now what do I do? But I've learned that that opportunity has made me um, a wealth of information, you know. And it, it's something that I like. I'm naturally good for. I, I'm naturally good at. Um, right now, I am doing the. Um, I'm learning how to be a mental health advocate for the county. Right? It's a peer support thing. And um, I went there the first day and. Um, uh, the first class, and they were talking about reentry and how somebody had a, had a, uh, you know, had a record, and how are they going to get a job? And I told the teacher, "Well, let me, I'll take that," you know. And I was, <laughs> and I told them all about, you know, uh, fairs that they can get their life scan and and um, they could start to rebuild their life because if when you clear when you when you can get rid of your record, you you get a lot of, you get rid of a lot of the stigma that's going to follow you. And that is important, you know, um, and, and so the next day, uh, I, which was Wednesday, I was late, uh, I was running behind because it's in Venice and I'm in Pedro. And when I walked in there, the girls go, oh my God, I thought you weren't going to come. And I'm like, what do you mean? They're all like, because you have so much information. 
you know, and they were so happy to see me. And I was like, wow, you know, I, I didn't know that I just by just giving that those little nuggets of information that people didn't know, uh, that gave them like hope, you know, and I was like, you know, and so what I today was my third day, they're like, oh, you're here. I'm like, why wouldn't I be here? Because they're just so thirsty for knowledge, you know, and, and the opportunities that I've been able to uh, through LARP and through my former employer and, and, and through Prop 47 with uh, Eunice Hernandez when we did the uh, Manifest Justice, you know, I have 18 expungements now. And so like I'm walking, I'm a walking billboard of what you can do when you change your record, you can change your life. And I think that those opportunities are available every single day. You know, when you walk into a, a just a market or and you're aware of your surroundings, because we always have to be aware of our surroundings. But when you when you can hear somebody just talking about like, oh, I am I just got out of I just I just got out of prison, I'm parole, what do I do now? You can step in and be like, look, I don't mean to oversee your conversation, but like, have you have you looked at the website LARP? You know, because I'm in a I'm in the community still that there's a lot of recidivism, you know, and, and and the system's designed to make you fail. And so I think that that's uh, when we can, when we have one, we have all because that's generational. So if you can get somebody to get rid of their record, especially a female, you know, that's their children. Their children can grow up to be different people just simply by just giving your, a, you know, an opportunity just to share your story or like, hey, go to the LARP website because that's what I'm always going to say because there's plenty of resources, you know. So that, I think that opportunity has, those opportunities are present every single day. It doesn't need to be in, in your line of work. It's just being in the community. And I know that Anthony's pretty big about going to, back to the community and offering those things to the community because if they don't know they don't they don't they don't know um i'm i have mental health issues which is on did the social identity disorder and uh today we're in class somebody was being um uh was being uh like uh discriminated against because they were uh they were uh disabled and i said did you know about the eeoc she started crying and i'm like it's okay <laughs> you know if you didn't know she's like i didn't know and I'm like, and, and that, those are, and those are powerful moments that keep you in it. Cause when you're helping others, you are helping yourself, but it shouldn't be just for that reason, but it should be just to help others, I think. And, and so I think that helps me a lot and it helps others as well. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Betty, did you have something to add? Um, I did. First, I want, I yeah. wanted to, First, I want, First, I wanted to um, say thank you, Jane. Every time I hear you talk, I always feel oh, uh, the passion that you have. And, and I, I'm so glad that I'm part of the LARP team with you as a leader. I'm glad I'm in this cohort with you. Oh, my. Um, thank you, Betty. And to, to answer uh, Rabia's question, yeah, oh. uh, I am not at um, Mount Sac anymore. But I did have um, two great years there, and I worked there too in the uh, writing center and in the um, speech and science center. So I was a tutor there on campus. Um, I actually got my degree in sociology there, and I went on to Cal Poly Pomona to get my BA in criminology, and I'm now in the master's program. So that brings me to answering the question, which is along the same lines as um, what Jane was saying. <laughs> Paying it forward is a big thing for me. And that's one of the reasons why I'm a LARP leader. And I'm on the education um, team because to me, education is so important. And not just formal education, not just academics, but like Jane was saying about housing, about mental health, about who you are, about being, telling your story. Um, I have such a passion about women being able to tell their story because I felt for so long that I wasn't able to. And um, when, when you have knowledge, when other people encourage you to talk, when you encourage other women to talk, when you can pass along information, that is so empowering. And um, to me, when um, I first met Anthony and he interviewed me about LARP and, and um, the policies, the education, the, um, the um, 
you know, the medical, all these committees that we were going to be working on. I just, I was like, oh my God, this is so important to me. And um, I think that for me, um, the opportunities that I've had um, to help other people, the things that I've learned to share that with other women coming out, to I even go back into the prisons with um, the prison education um, project. I go back into prisons and I teach. I teach through Zoom meetings. I teach on campus. I, I um, tutor on campus. Uh, like I said, I'm in the MPA program. So I also tutor uh, undergraduates. To me, education is so powerful. And like I said, it's not just about academics. I, I tutor students that who know nothing about the prison system, about life and how, you know, how in one second your life can be turned upside down um, by bad decisions, by bad choices. So I'm that person that says, I made a lot of bad choices in my life. I'm not really that different than you. I just made a lot of bad choices. And, I, and now that I'm wiser, I know what choices not to make. I can't tell you what choices but to make, but I can tell you what happened to me. And maybe that can help guide you. And now that I'm out and I'm free, I can help other women who are coming home. I can help guide them and say, these are some of the mistakes I made. And these, this is the route I took. And this, I was successful at this. You may take a different route, but this is how I see success. And this is how I've seen other women take these routes and this is how they've been successful. You may take a little bit different road here or there, but basically I feel the education, uh, knowledge, um, following along that path is, is, is a win. Um, I think I answered the question. <laughs> yes, you did. Let me pass this over to Rabia, please. Uh, you know, I, I love when I listen to Betty because <laughs> talking about Reintegration Academy, Dr. Reese, Professor Ty, I did like student auditing work with them. Yeah. I was in, yeah, so when I first got out in LA, um, I remember I felt so lost, right? I was like, I understand that West Coast has things coming up in reentry. There's reformations being made, but where do I start? And I think LARP was the first website <laughs> that I logged into and started kind of from there going on forwards, understanding how re-entry looks like um, in Los Angeles. Um, what are the resources available to us? Um, what opportunities can I be a part of? And how I can use my skill set in advocacy world to empower other peoples and also get my voice across the table, right? Um, and so being Coming from a background in academia, I do believe helped me um, reintegrate back into the society. My education stopped right at the foot door of the incarceration facility that I was in. Um, and so I was away for almost five years. And so coming back, I think one of the things I was really worried about was how am I gonna get back into the field uh, where, I, where my life had stopped because now I have a criminal record. And so the wonderful thing about being in Los Angeles, um, coming from the state of Texas, is that there's a lot of work being done for formerly incarcerated students, for formerly incarcerated leaders, advocates, and scholars to be in spaces where in uh, Southern states, you don't hear that. Um, and so the one thing that I believe that I worked on um, in my reentry um, journey, which gave me a lot of opportunities was networking, the power of networking, the power of getting my nose into spaces where, you know, I might feel uncomfortable, but let's just make myself in there. Um, because you would not believe how many beautiful people you meet that come from different experiences, but at the same time, you become a one big family. And so the higher education um, network here in, in, in California, you know, um, through Project Rebound, through rising scholars, through underground scholars, is a network that 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 that's literally its own mafia, right? <laughs> and so, to once you're part of that family, then opportunities and doors just open up itself. Just as being us in um, LARP spaces, where you know um, you're 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 in 
you're in meetings where you can actually voice your opinions, your, 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 your ideas and your points um, where the policies and legislations are being held. And that to, to me is, is, is a wonderful feeling, right? And, and being so early on in my reentry journey, um, I do think that pushing yourself is number one key. You cannot, uh, you cannot take, uh, you cannot think yourself as not being an expert just because you don't have professional development skills for over years, right? And so my focal point uh, was to understand how am I going to get my, myself professionally integrated in this community? And so LARP has been great. Um, I uh, ended up uh, being one of the policy justice fellows with Education Trust, which was one of the beautiful opportunities that I was given because um, not only not only we were one of, it was eight out of 400 people that just chose. And um, that was one of my ways to link policy work into spaces where I know I wouldn't be there otherwise. Um, and so I think with opportunities, um, I don't think they're ever handed to us, but I think coming from a state of Texas to California, California is a ground of resources. And a lot of people forget if you do a little bit legwork, um, do a little bit networking, it can get you to a lot of spaces where you think you wouldn't be there. Thank you for that. Um, I wanted to ask one more question as we kind of wrap up this evening and this, you know, every one of you guys, I want you guys to answer, but from your own experience, what's something important that people should know about reentry? Um, we talk about reentry services. We talk about women's importance um, in navigating these carceral landscapes and surviving, but just to the average person that is unfamiliar with you know, your own narratives, your own struggles and everything, what are some of the important things that you would like to explain about reentry? Um, so we can start there. Um, I, I guess I'll start. I go, it's not, you go? Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'll go. Um, it's not gonna be easy. Your, losing your number is not gonna be easy. Um, it takes effort. Um, I know that like, when I'm talking to to women um, about like okay, so now you're out with with what's your plans? Like, what are we? What are you thinking? And I have to remember like when I was that client, not knowing what I wanted to do. All I knew is that I was doing the next indicated step. And the next indicated step was bringing me uh, a life. It was giving me back a life that I have, had given away. Um, so I think that knowing that like. It's not going to be easy, but it is doable. And, and I'm going to piggyback on what Betty was saying about how your actions cause reactions. And that's something very important to remember because every step you take is a step to freedom or a step right back over that wall, you know, and, and, it, it, and, and it's kind of your choice, you know, how are we how are you going to choose to live your life now that like the worst has happened um which for me was prison um that was the worst thing that 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 had happened to me besides the addictions besides the alcoholism um besides you know the event that that gave me my diagnosis being in a position where you don't um get to you don't you get you get told when to when to take a shower, when to get up, when to sleep, when to when everything's pre-programmed for you, um, you know. And I know that like one of the big things when I got out was my mom took me to go eat, and I ate that food in like two minutes because she was like, "Why wow, calm down?" I'm like, "You're so trained that you you never know when a fight's gonna break out, so you better eat because you don't know when you're gonna when if that, you're gonna be able to complete your meal." So just knowing that like that you don't want to go back to the environment is half the battle and, 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 and losing your number is is not an easy thing but it is a lot easier now with the with with larp and all the re-entry things that are going on now you can come out and do your prop 47 and for free yeah that's amazing you know um so i think that just just knowing that it is doable but it's not easy because nothing in life that's good is never really easy i think and i and, and, and to me that was uh uh, I think that I get more discouraged now uh, in, in now that I have a lot of, you know, I've gotten my life back and I have a lot more things to lose 
than I did when I when I got out. All I knew is that I just didn't want to go back, and um, I did everything I possibly could to make sure that that didn't happen. And and I think that's important to understand that it's what in in, in life and in, in general, if you want it, you'll get it. It doesn't matter if it's insurmountable. I know that when when I would wake up in the morning, I didn't have no money and I didn't have any, this was back in the day when I was drinking music and I had no money, but by 12 o'clock, I had that. And, and picking back on Robbie, I says, we are very uh, resourceful individuals. You know, you can start in the morning, have no money, but at the end of the day, you got a lot of things going on, you know? And so if we use that drive, use that drive to what we do, to, to do the, to get yourself out of the position that you have, get out, lose your number, I think that that's a good for me that was the best advice anybody gave me like use your knowledge like you already got you already got the hustle now hustle your way out of this problem so i think that's that's what i want to like say about reentry as far as getting your life back thank you for that betty um rabia laura did you want to add to that i do um i, I think do. i want um, i want society to know that um we we are viable women we we can be a part of society we are a part of society and we can contribute so much and um we just need that chance and i want to thank um you know larp i want to thank you guys for this opportunity for people to get just a little glimpse at who we are, because when people say um, women that are formerly incarcerated, women that just got out of prison, you know, there's a, you know, you know, probably a conjuring of what that looks like. And when they see us, these beautiful women, um, and they hear us speak, you know, hopefully it dispels <laughs> what has been conjured up and they hear us speak, they hear our knowledge and um, thank you for this format. And um, I just wanna let, give us a chance, give us a chance to um, prove that we deserve to be here and that, you know, thank you for letting us have the opportunity to be free and to have a wonderful life. Thank you, Betty. Rabia, did you want to add? Yeah, um, I'll just, like yeah, I said, um, I'll just, is it my, can y'all hear me? Okay, I can so hear. as Jane um, and Betty said, you know, re-entry is not easy journey. I mean, you know, especially for women ourselves, our re-entry journey looks different than men. And so we see a lot of obstacles, we see a lot of barriers. I mean, it, it ranges from um, employment to professional spaces, to education, um, and, and also in integrated health itself, right? Um, and so re-entry journey is not only just finding yourself again, but it's also understanding the whole he healing process from incarceration. And so um, for the folks, you know, that, that, that want to take away something from me is, um, you know, when you're going through your own reentry journey or, you know, a loved one who is, um, please let them know that don't hesitate to ask questions from people who have been through the process before. Um, don't shy away from asking for support because you would not believe how many people will be willing to help you. Um, you know, and we have this whole idea when we're incarcerated that, we're kind of looking out our, for ourselves um, in this community, but they are supporters for yourself. And also um, don't get discouraged when you hear no. You're, there's gonna be a lot more no's than yeses, but what happens at the end are those no's are almost an investment in your successes. And so, um, and finally, I would probably finish off by saying that whatever goals you're attaining, make an action plan um, and start off by making short-term commitments. Right. Um, and, and even take it day by day, take it week by week, um, however it works for you and kind of keep yourself focused and also stay away from like the problematic behaviors that got you uh, incarcerated or in trouble with the criminal justice system, because that's how you're going to understand, um, you know, who you are, uh, what your triggers are and how your reentry, um, you know, is going to look like for the future. 
I appreciate every one of you um, women on this panel tonight. And I thought this was the last question, but I wanted to do one more. Um, you speak about healing and I want to hear from you, all of you women on, on how to heal from the trauma um, that you've endured and survived in this carceral state. Um, as an educator myself, we are getting in, you know, we talk about trauma with our students, but I, I wanna hear from you. How do you heal? Um, in a landscape that doesn't even want you guys to heal and, and recover and, and be successful. Um, so if you would just end and, and, and just speak on that, on, on how you guys heal from the trauma from a carceral state. Uh, I'll start. Um, um, Betty, uh, I'll Jane. start. Okay, um, Jane. Uh, go ahead, Betty. Is she there? Be uh, go ahead, Betty. Is she there? Yes. Okay, so I'll speak. Um, we can hear you, Jane. Okay, yeah. Okay, okay so I'll um, um, I do, it's a lot of feedback. Okay, I do um, um, therapy. I do a lot of therapy. So for me, um, the only thing that can help a dissociative identity disorder diagnosis is therapy. It was very hard for, difficult for me to talk about the things that went on in my um, household culturally. It's frowned upon. You know, you're not supposed to t say, what happened, who it happened to, why it happened, you know, that, that's not in your concern. You just suck it up and you move on. Um, so for me, my healing process has been definitely helping others, but uh, talking about my trauma, that, that this is so important. Um, you know, um, my, my goal is to um, make therapy uh, billable through uh, a compulsory assessment for therapeutic services. I think that there's more... Uh, disassociation as far as trauma that we endure as is, is uh, I know there's kids out there that go to school who live in who live in uh, the projects who go to school through gun uh, you know checking for your guns who who don't have them maybe need glasses and they think that oh this is a dumb kid but they really need glasses or, or they, you know maybe they got hit in the side of the head when they were kids by their parent uh, by somebody and they can't hear you know say like uh, Ravi was uh, do follow-up questions if you hear a no ask why, what, what can I do differently next time? Because talking and asking questions is the only way to heal. For me, it was my only way to heal, start to begin healing from the trauma that um, was uh, put upon me. You know, and uh, they had told me one time in the 12 step program, and then I'll, I'll wrap it up, um, that when um, you're, you, you play a part in everything that happens to you. And I'm like, no, I didn't. I was a kid uh, when my, uh, at, you know, severe sexual trauma happened. How can I be responsible for that? And, uh, and my sponsor told me, because if you allow it, if you continue to fester it and don't grow, like, sh like, let it go, rip it to shreds, write it on a piece of paper and let it go. It's always going to dictate your decisions. And those decisions um, can be the ones that you've always made that got you here. And I'm like, hmm, that made sense to me because it's not, it's, life is only 99% of what happened, 1% of what happens to you and 99% of how you react to it. And I think that's important for healing. For my healing, it was how I was reacting, talking about what happened and, and understanding that no matter culturally what they try to tell you is wrong, may not be the right thing and, and, and talk, ask a follow-up question. Don't take no for an answer. Just ask why. Maybe do differently that, that that next time. Communication for me is my healing. Thank you. Thank you for that, Jane. Um, I think uh, Dr. Dennis had to step away because she was having some technical difficulties with her computer. So I'm just going to go ahead and um, uh, go down the next person who uh, somebody else would like to answer that question in the form of how you're healing. Yeah. Um, so you're absolutely right, um, Jane. Um, for me, it healing um, is a, is a three part thing for me also, and it's almost exactly the same thing as you said. Um, you know, telling my story, so communication is very important about it. Um, but not just telling my story, but having someone listen to it. I mean, you can tell and you can talk. I did that when I was a child, and um, I did that when I was a teenager and 
the fact that no one listened to me was the worst part of the trauma. Uh, no one believed me. So having someone listen to me, so that's a part of healing. So telling my story, having someone listen to me, and the next part is forgiving. Once you're able to communicate and tell your story and have someone listen to you and tell you, okay, it's all right, you know, and then you're able to move on by forgiving in whatever way you choose to forgive, whether that's through God, whether that's through prayer, whether that's through um, mediation, whether that's through um, whatever it is, uh, whatever it is in your heart, doing that, um, for me, that's how I heal. And it's just that simple for me. Thank you very much for sharing, Betty. That's powerful. Um, I, I love how, um, how you describe that to be. Um, that's amazing. Um, anybody else would like to answer? Yeah, I, I would, you know, it is so beautiful. Um, we see healing looks so different for people, right? Um, how Jane describes her healing, how Betty describes her healing. And, and, and as Betty said, my healing um, is more simple than what, what it seems like. I think I do my healing literally on an everyday basis. You know what I mean? From from my workspaces um, to 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 the space here today that we're here, where we're we're sharing our narratives, we're talking to each other, we're empowering each other's voices, and I think um, healing has different aspects, um, and part of that is also helping yourself um, understand your physical and your mental well-being. So, you know, make sure that you're you're checking yourself um, every hour, every every 30 minutes, if it takes, just to ensure you're doing okay. Um, you know, going to the gym, working out for to getting better sleep. I think that's that's healing for me. And then one of the uh, most rewarding healing is seeing my work actually kind of like shine through right in our community. Uh, we work in spaces where we're advocates and we're leaders and we're scholars. And when we see like, you know, the good results, the, the as we are so goal oriented, we see things actually happening. We see actionable moments taking place. And I think those um, moments are healing for me. Thank you so much for that. Anthony, any closing remarks um, before we kind of wrap things up? I was kicked out of the webinar, but I'm back, y'all. So I apologize for the technological problems. But Anthony, please. Anything? Yeah, I just I just like to say that um, I'm so inspired by each and every one of you. Um, there's a reason why um, I felt like I needed to make sure that um, each and every one of you were part of the Leadership Training Academy as leaders, because um, you know, you are leaders in my eyes and in LARP's eyes. You are very powerful and strong individuals in your own right. And um, I know you you all will achieve many great things and make an impact in this world. So uh, with that being said, I always encourage you and support you in any way that I can. I have all of your backs in any form that I can. And um, post the Leadership Training Academy, you have my information, you can always reach out. You always, if you ever need my help for anything, I can um, be sure that you can you can feel safe that that I will be there to support in any way that I can. Okay, and uh, with that being said, I really do um, uh, also appreciate the fact that you were so open and honest, and uh, uh, you know you, you felt this was like a, a vulnerable place, a safe space for you to speak and give your input on everything and answer those questions, and also you know just have this open dialogue about empowering women and, and creating this space to um, acknowledge that there's still a lot of work to be done. Is the, that is why I'm in this space. And uh, we're not gonna stop fighting for those that feel like they don't have a voice. So thank you very much for everything. Thank you, Anthony. As we close out tonight's event, I wanted to remind everybody that we have an event on May 5th um, that will feature Anthony, the leaders. It's going to be in the college library, the innovation lab. Um, this is a chance for us to give updates on the Mervyn Dimely collection that was processed, but also the public archive that LARP and Project Rebound has created. Last semester, we opened the archive up to collect narratives, and we're going to extend that um, opportunity to the current cohort of the leaders as well as LARP members as well. So please save the date for the May 5th event. You'll get a little email, a little advertisement. We would love to see you in person, face to face. 
Um, and so we can again share space and talk about preserving these important narratives. Um, so with that, ladies, I am so grateful to share the space with you. I've learned quite a lot. Um, the PhD doesn't mean nothing um, when I'm in the room with you and your wisdom that you guys have offered. And I think that is so important, that's so valuable. Um, you can't get that you know, in, in a classroom sometimes. And I think that my students, those that were in the audience, um, will benefit from your wisdom. Yes, Jane, it is going to be in person. We're going to follow COVID protocol, but I want to see everybody's face in person. I want to see Anthony and, you know, we want to see LARP and, and, and communicate. So Betty and, and Rabia and, and Laura and, and everybody at LARP, um, May 5th, save that date. We're going to have some food too, which is important, but we also want to talk and, and dialogue and, and you know, celebrate our students that worked on the archive, but also celebrate your success as well. And so we're going to build community and we're going to continue building community um, every time we come to the table, either on Zoom or face to face. Uh, Anthony, any la last closing remarks before we just kind of end the evening? Um, just, yeah. thank you. just thank you very much for everything. And, uh, you know, keep being the leaders that you are. And uh, we're going to make a change in this world together for sure. Thank you so much. And we'd like to thank the audience. So thank you. Um, if I could like flash a heart symbol, I would on the webinar, but I don't think I have those capabilities right now. Um, yeah. But again, thank you so much. The wisdom that you guys dropped on us tonight is, is so much, is so valuable. Um, and uh, thank you, Dr. Dennis and Azalea and Kelsey yes, for this collaboration. Really do appreciate this, this space and uh, the platform that you're providing for us to, to allow this thank discussion you. to happen. It's the, it was the history department and the college library and then the American Communities Program that really supports this idea. And we honor the fact that education, our institution is really, you know, becoming that advocate for space. Um, especially with incarcerated women. And so it's never a problem to join and link and, and really do this as a community-based event as well. So thank you again, Betty and Rabia and Jane and Lara and Anthony for sharing your narratives this evening. Um, we hope to see you at May 5th, okay? So save the I'll day. Yes, I'm excited. Let's go, let's thank do this. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Um, Dr. Pugash, thank you for coming. She's my colleague as well in the history department, a supporter of this. And so thank you again uh, for sharing space. With that, I will bid you farewell. Have a great weekend. Stay safe, please. Thank you so much. Bye everybody. Thank Bye, you. Everybody. Bye. Have a good night. Great Bye. weekend. Bye.